He is risen. He is no longer in the grave. The angel said, he's no longer there. Just as he has said, he is risen. Amen. Amen. Y'all give it up for uh, Pastor Tez. Y'all see the young prince from Africa? Y'all see that, right? <laughs> he come back from Kenya. The whole family looking like coming back, coming to America. Man, you look good, dog. Y'all look good. Amen. <laughs> give God praise. And thank God for the leaders, the deacons of this house. Y'all just, y'all do a wonderful job. Everything is done in excellence at Connect. I love that. Um, but y'all help me to welcome my beautiful wife, the gorgeous, beautiful, talented Dr. Mr. Candace Richardson. Don't she look good, y'all? Listen, now, she don't want me to say this, but her, neck, her birthday is next Tuesday, April 2nd. Now, I'm not going to say her age. I'm going to let her say it if she want to say it, but she look good. That's my heart. That's my baby. I love you. You look good. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, no, I'm not going to say my age. But <laughs> um, I give God praise. I give God praise. And I want to say I am so in love with Jesus. Mm, come on. I am so in love with him. I think as we were working through the play, God revealed some things in my heart. And, and I'm grateful for that because my prayer always is, God, expose me to me. Because the only way that I can grow is if I see what is inside of me that should not be there. And so I'm so grateful that in every opportunity, God reveals me to me so I can repent and I can get closer to God. And I want to thank God so much for my husband who is such a man of God. And, and I love the fact that my husband does not just preach this word. He lives this word. And he is not short of rebuking and discipling me to make sure that I walk in the way that I ought to walk. And so I'm grateful that we can work with each other and be iron sharpening iron. Okay. I'm grateful for that. So God, I come before you right now and I lift you up. And I praise your holy name, God, because there is none like you. None in the heavens and none in the earth. God, we give you honor. God, we give you glory and praise. And I thank you for being a God who reveals. God, you reveal, Lord God, what we need to do so we can be closer to you. What we need to do, Lord God, so that we can take up this bloodstained banner and, ex and show it to the world. Yes. I pray right now, Lord God, as Rick Pastor Ricardo gets ready to bring your word, I pray, God, it is none of him and all of you. I pray right now as he opens up his mouth that the Holy Spirit will fill it. I pray, Lord God, that the words that come forth comes directly from the throne of God. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, prepare our soul, Lord God. Father God, that the seed will be, Father God, planted in good soil so that it can grow. Help each and every one of us that when we leave out of here, we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I thank you, God, if we need a transplanted heart, give that unto us as well. I thank you and I love you. In Jesus' mighty, powerful, magnificent name, I pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you, baby, so much for that prayer. We give God praise. We give God praise. Y'all ready for this word? Yes, sir. Come on, I'm excited. I'm excited about this word today. It's Resurrection Sunday, y'all. We can get in this word. Our opening seed is found in the book of John. The book of John. My assignment is in the book of John. John chapter 10, verse 14. It should be on your screens. John chapter 10, verse 14. When you have it, say amen. John 10, verse 14. Please stand for the reading of the word of God, as we do in this house. We love to honor our king as he is worthy. Amen. Jesus is teaching. Read. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17. The reason the father loves me is that I lay down my life. 
only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. An authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Abba Father, let your thoughts be obedient. Let my thoughts be obedient to Christ, O God, my King. Let my words be the word of truth, Father, and let the way be the way of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. Please be seated. Amen. Get comfortable. Get comfortable. My subject today is to answer the question of the why of the cross. So I'm going to give an open book test today. So grab your pens and take good notes. I want to begin with a thought. For you to think of this one thought, this question, this one thought. Why was Jesus resurrected? This is Resurrection Sunday. And all over the globe, there'll be people talking about the resurrection. There'll be biographies and biopics and interviews and debates on TV whether Jesus arose from the dead. But there are historical writings, eyewitness accounts about the resurrection. Validating the resurrection. Go with me to this text. Look at Matthew 27, verse 30, verse 50, sorry. Matthew 27, verse 50. This eyewitness account will blow your mind. Picture this, verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split. And the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Is that in your Bible? Are we reading the same Bible? They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. And went into the holy city and appeared to many. When Jesus gave up the spirit, those that were dead in him came to life. The tombs broke open, but they waited in the tombs until he was resurrected. Y'all miss it. When Jesus was resurrected, they got up out of the tombs and went into the city to testify the resurrection. Y'all tell me when God give you eyewitnesses, he give you eyewitnesses. Come on, somebody. But my focus is not the what today. My focus is the why. See, many of us are quick to ask God why about our situations. Come on, y'all know about trials and temptations and stress and issues we go through. We're always asking God why. Why am I going through this, God? But too few of us ask God why about the life of Jesus Christ. See, I've discovered that. To know the why of Jesus Christ is to know your purpose. See, when you understand the purpose of Christ, of Christ, then you can understand your purpose in Christ. We are going to answer the purpose, the question of purpose of Jesus' resurrection for those for the purpose of his birth, his death, and his resurrection are inseparable as it relates to the impact our king had on the kingdom. The greatest gift God ever gave us was life. Would you agree? Sure. The greatest gift God gave you is your life. That's a gift from God. God told the prophet Jeremiah, before I knew you, how ah, you was in your mother's womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I set you apart to do the work. Doesn't that sound a speak to the hand of a loving father on us from birth? He has his hands on you from birth. But listen, your life is no mistake. You are a gift from God. I don't care what no one else tells you, you are a gift from God. God always had his hands on you. King David says, for you created my utmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You're hearing the confirmation? I love this part though. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Make that declaration with me today. Say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I give God praise that you believe that statement. 
See, God created the sun, the stars, the moons, the plants, the animals, and man. And pulled them from their source. From the gases, he pulled the sun. From the water, he pulled the fish. But from himself, he pulled man. And gave us the gift called life. But now, this next statement may come as a shock to you. It came as a shock to me when I began to study it. And I did understand the more I studied it, the more it became a paradox. The greatest gift God ever gave man was life. The first greatest gift. The second greatest gift God ever gave man was death. Hmm. I know you're saying the same thing I said when Pastor Miles explained it to me. He said, life is a gift and death is a gift. And even Satan meant as a curse. But let me explain what, what he do for evil. God will turn it around. See, God blew his breath in Adam, and Adam became a living soul, taken from God, his source. Remember God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness? Genesis 1.26, God is the source of the spirit man who has the breath of God. God created man and made man. Man is both created from God and made from the dust. We're about to get deep in this seed today. Come on, y'all. Uh, uh, he put a border around the tree. But man crossed the border and allied with Satan of the dark kingdom. And they form a coup against the king of the universe, God. They rebelled. He allied with Satan to rebel. And so what happened? Death which had no power or dominion over man, seized power and dominion over man when he disobeyed God, his king. Come on, somebody. He gave death life to kill him. This is good, y'all. The serpent heard the law of God. So he convinced man to break the law. You know why? Because he knew that breaking the law has the punishment built in. All right, for example, the maker of your car, they, he puts a law, he's the manufacturer. He, he created the car, so he puts a law on it and says, do not put anything other than motor oil, 10W30 in it. But see, because Crisco oil looked like motor oil, you put that in your car. What happens if you put Crisco oil in the car? Come on, tell me what happens. It'll break down, it'll malfunction. Some of y'all think I'm still talking about the body of your car. I'm talking about your body. If you disobey the instructions of your maker and put the wrong thing in your body, it'll malfunction and break down. Who am I talking to? Well, let me put it this way. Let me, let me put it this way. See, some of you may understand this. If you don't follow the instructions of your maker, it'll malfunction. So you need to face it and make sure you know who's in your ear. Telling you the terms and conditions to live by. Listen to me. Because eternal life is in the blood. Well, hey, listen, just like how, just like how the, the engine's life is in the oil, your life is in the blood. But the right blood, the blood of the lamb, come on somebody, help me with this word today. Satan wanted to give man death. But God reversed the curse. And what the devil meant for evil, God turned it for good. <laughs> Oh, listen, God is awesome. God put man in a garden kingdom. You do know man had a kingdom on the earth. He put man in a garden kingdom, and life was supposed to be everlasting. But disobedience and sin turned man's everlasting life into neverlasting life. All right, this soil is about ready for this seed right now. Go to John 10, John 10 verse 18. Ah, listen to the words of Jesus. He says, the reason, everyone say reason. Reason is an explanation of the why or purpose. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life. Everyone say lay down. As in I surrender it. I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. No one kills me, he says. But I lay it down of my own accord. That's my own will. I have authority to lay it down. And authority to take it up again. 
This command is from the Father. Yo, this is loaded with truth. Okay, right away Jesus says, the reason the Father loves me is that I lay down my life. He, get, he qualifies what love's supposed to be in the earth. Okay, this one is a bonus. This one is, media team, put up, um, put up John 15 verse 13 for me. No, no, go to verse 12. I'm going to start with verse 12. Verse 12. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. Y'all see it? You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. Last week, Sunday, Dominique, Candice, and I went to a wedding for our nephew, Bernay. That's why we were absent last Sunday. And at the wedding, it was a typical wedding vows that was recited. Um, but I was thinking about the words that were said in light of what Jesus defined as love. The typical wedding vows goes something like this. I can just take you, Ricardo, to be my lawfully wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, to cherish, till death do us part. Some of y'all recite those words. Oh, y'all, not familiar, right? Ah, but listen. Because of the Father's definition and Jesus' demonstration, maybe the vow should read something like this. I, Ricardo, take you, Candice, to be my lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part, and, here it is, to lay down my life for you. I wonder how many of us will take those vows. Maybe we won't have so, so much issues with divorce in this country. But again, maybe we won't have so many marriages either. Let that sink in. If you're married, give your best answer. Would you make this voice, this, uh, this declaration, this vow? Just be honest, but make sure it's the right one. <laughs> spouse is the, the spouse is here. But maybe now we see the impact of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his son to die for it. For God so loved the world, he gave of himself to die so we could have life again. That's deep, y'all. That exegesis of love in this text is, is, is what love should be. Next time someone say, I love you, I just love you, ask them, are you willing to lay your life on it? You love me so much, are you willing to lay your life down for me? Because that's what Jesus did. That's true love. The greatest gift God gave man was life. What? Life. The second greatest gift is death. So watch this. So then Jesus Christ is the greatest gift God ever gave man in life and in death. God reversed the curse with Jesus when he was willing to lay down his life. So death is now a doorway. Ah, oh, y'all get this. Listen to me. Death is now a doorway back to life. Y'all ain't hearing me in here. Jesus is the door, the way, and the life. Ooh, John 18, go back to the text. We're still in the same text. John 18, watch it. Jesus says, no one takes it from me. Speaking of his life. But I lay it down of my own accord. My own will. I have authority. Come on, some To lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my... Notice every time Jesus talks about death, he talks about life. He never mentions suffering or death without mentioning life right next. Because he is the truth. The life and the door. And the door. All right. The door, faces, the door faces both ways simultaneously. Right? On the outside of the door, there may be a storm that can take life and cause death. But on the inside of the door, there's life and peace. On this... Jesus is the door. He is the door. But he's not just the doorway for, to life again when death comes. He's the door of authority. 
Did you get it? He says, my father gave a command to lay it down, to lay my life down and to take it up again, to swing the door, open and close as I choose. Come on, somebody. Glory be to God. But you have to accept him. He's the door. Jesus, uh, we, we, we about to show you something. We about to lay this down. I know y'all asking, we. I have multiple personalities, if y'all didn't know. Me and the Holy Spirit. And when I decrease, he increase. So we about to show you something today. When I surrender, he takes over. There is a promise that I am trying to lay down. The promise of the Father, because what? The promise of God is what? Yes and amen. Come on, we get some Bible readers. Remember what I, remember what I said? That life and death is, is a gift to Jesus Christ. Here's the gift. Here's the gift. Isaiah 9, 6 prophesied. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Many of us have heard his gift of birth before. But what about the gift of death and resurrection? Here's the gift of death. Prophesied. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. But the big one is the gift of life again. Through the resurrection, also prophesied. Here it is, Isaiah 53, 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, a guilt offering, he, Jesus, will see his offspring and prolong his days. That means even though Jesus died, he will rise again to see his offspring, the ones redeemed back to God. God promised me, Jesus says, if I lay down my life as king, I can take it up again as king, and I'll see my offspring the ambassador in the earth of Christ when I raise. God sowed one son, a seed, and raised billions of sons. Some of y'all can get that on the way home. All right, write this down, write this down. The why of the purpose. I told you, open book test. Number one, the resurrection was proof that Jesus solved man's problem of sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Jesus had no sin, so death had no authority to kill him. Number two, the resurrection was proof that Jesus conquered and took death, took power back from death. Death has power, y'all. The majority of the people in the world are afraid to die. They are afraid of death. Come on, y'all know the truth. Death has power to shut your eyes and your ears permanently and render you immobile. If you don't believe me, you go to awake of your loved ones and try to talk to them. They won't respond. Because death has that kind of power over them. But I always wonder why they call it awake. Jesus was the only one that went to awake and raise and wake the man, Lazarus. <laughs> he go to awake and he showed up to wake someone up. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Number three. The resurrection was proof that Jesus reclaimed authority, the authority of man in the earth. The religious leaders asked Jesus, where did you get all his authority? That was baffled. Where did, where did you get all his authority? Jesus says, I'm going to ask you one question. I ask you this question. You answer my question, I'm going to answer yours. John's baptism, was it of heaven or of man? They couldn't answer. They didn't want to answer because they knew they would err. So Jesus said, neither will I tell you where I get all his authority. But let me tell you, in Genesis 126, God said, let them. When God used that pronoun, them, have dominion, he transferred his authority from himself to man. He never transferred his power. All power, absolute power belongs to God. But he transferred his authority to the man in Genesis 126. That's what Satan was after, the authority. He can't get, he tried to take God's power and was evicted. So he said, the next best thing is the authority. Come on, somebody. Uh, listen, God never moves in the earth without going through a man. Let me prove it to you. In order to save Israel, he moved through the authority of Moses. 
in order to save the world, he moved through authority of Jesus. I, I, won't, I won't work this seed. I won't work this seed. Number four, the resurrection was proof that Jesus is the Christ. This the one. This the one that everyone had issue and problem with. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, they went to the Romans to use this one to help them crucify Jesus. This the issue. See, they had no grounds to put him to death. Because when Jesus told Pilate, even you have no authority, Pilate. And Pilate was the governor of Roman government, the most powerful military might ever in the history of the world. Jesus told him, listen, Pilate, you, you have no authority over me. If I want to dispatch legions from, angels, from, from, from heaven right now, they'll come and wipe this place out. You have no authority, so do your job. That's what you're here to do. <laughs> come on. Y'all. Jesus was in total control. I would think that. They took his life, but they, no, he's laid it down. He surrendered it. He has power. He's king. Nobody took it. He's the Christ. That's the problem. The word Christ in Greek and Hebrew is transliterated. It means lost in translation as anointed one, but it's much more deeper than that. He was the anointed Jewish king in the line of David, but, but the order of Melchizedek. Don't miss this. He was in the line of David. The scepter shall never depart from Judah. He will have an everlasting kingdom. So he was in the line of King David. So they knew he was a king. But he was of the order of Melchizedek, the high priest and king of Salem or king of peace. Come on, he was ordained by God to be in his position. Ooh, listen, the first, anointed, the first anointed man was Moses, anointed by the Holy Spirit. To carry out the administration of Israel. And then 70 elders in Numbers 11 all fall under the Holy Spirit to help him administer Israel. Tell me what religious organization you know have an administration. Now which government? Governments have administration. Moses was given the power to administrate Israel. And then the next anointed king was Saul who was the king of Israel. Jesus was anointed to be the king of kings. The Christ. This was the issue they had. This is the issue they had. So we started with a question, the why of the cross. The why of the, why was Jesus resurrected? Jesus answers this with a question. I love when Jesus asks a question. He always, he knows he's going. He wants you to know what you're asking him to figure it out by your answer to his question. We are about to bring this together. Look at Matthew 16, verse 13. I had to set this up so we understand where we're going. Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Oh, we're getting to it right now. We're getting to the point right now. Watch this. This question was so important because Jesus is coming to the end of his ministry. He wants to make sure they get it. If anyone have to get it, it have to be the 12 who's following me. Now, the others may not get it, but they have to get this before I go back to the Father. This is important. Why? Because who I am qualifies me to do what I'm called to do. Ah, y'all missed that thing. They replied, some say John the Baptist, that's a prophet. Some say Elijah, another prophet. Some say Jeremiah, still another prophet, another the prophets. Prophets cannot have a kingdom. Ah, come on somebody. (sighs) Jesus ignored them. And he said, what about you? What do you say? Because he knew, you can't qualify me as a prophet because I'm a king. I was born king, died king, rise king. Watch this. Who do you say I am? He want to know what their thoughts are. They didn't know. They still didn't know. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon The word Simon means listener. Blessed are you, listener. Because it didn't come from flesh and blood. Don't take credit. It didn't come from you. God gave it. You listened to God and he gave you the answer. Upon this rock of you listening by faith to God, I'll build my church. Don't think it was built on Peter the man. It was built on the faith that he heard from the king. Okay. All right. 
I will build my church. And this rock, the ecclesia, the administration, the senate, the embassy in the earth, he says. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. That's it. Now we have to cover up the seed. We almost done covering the seed up. Isaiah prophesied Jesus was the one born king. Isaiah prophesied Jesus was the one who died king, confirmed by the Roman governor Pilate. When, when, when Pilate crucified him, he didn't want to do it. He, he still put a sign up over the cross. Remember that? The sign says, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. In Aramaic, Greek, and in Latin. Why? Because he wanted everyone to know. The chief priest said, don't put that. But he said he was the king of the Jews. These people hating still. Pilate said, what I've written? I have written his birth, death, and resurrection. Y'all are all prophetic. My assignment is almost done. My assignment is almost done. And the fact, though, that Jesus' entire life was a prophetic manifestation. Begin to the why. Follow me. In other words, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 9.10. We just, we just showed you. Isaiah showed you his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection was prophesied. And he also said, when I die, I'll get up again. When I lay it down, I'll get up again. Everything he did was foretold. Remember the promises of God are what? Yes, and Jesus is the Amen. Revelation 3.14. Now as I close, I want to show you the ultimate purpose of the resurrection, the why. Listen to this verse and I will take my seat. Book. Listen to this verse. Matthew no, Luke, sorry, Luke 24, 46. Luke 24, 46. Then he said to them, thus it is written, that means it's a law. And thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to be raised from the dead the third day. Jesus even tell you how long he's going to be in the grave. And that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. What should be preached? Repentance. The kingdom of God is here. Repent, for he's here. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of the Father. Everybody say promise. The what? The promise of the Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endured with power from on high. Adam lost this power, y'all. But Jesus is about to give it back to us again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, listen, remember the promise in Genesis 3.15? Here's the promise. Let me remind you. The seed of the woman, Jesus, will crush the serpent's head, which means authority. Satan took the authority. Jesus says, the seed of this woman will crush your head and take the authority back. Uh, from Adam and give it back to man. Adam lost authority. He didn't lose a religion. All right. He lost relationship with the Father and his personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. The governor that governed his life. The purpose of the cross and the purpose of the resurrection is to bring back what Adam lost. That's restoration. Man didn't lose a religion. Man lost a kingdom. His rulership and his authority in the earth as co-regent with God Almighty. Oh, God. Acts 1.8. In Acts 1.8, we discover who the promise is. Not just what the promise. The promise was to bring back the kingdom. But there's a who attached to this. Ah, y'all get this, get this, get y'all get this. After Jesus is resurrected, he meets with his disciples and tells them, Go into all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, one more scripture, one more scripture. This is the why. Acts 1.8 But 
you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth there's a kingdom with no borders this is why Jesus had to die on the cross to be resurrected again so that the Holy Spirit can be restored to man again with power that Adam lost to operate in the kingdom of God here on the earth help me somebody my time is up uh, the seed is in the ground the Holy Spirit is delivered back to man by Jesus the King to again be the governor of man's lives in the kingdom of God and now the kingdom has no borders and the Holy Spirit is everywhere at the same time when Jesus told the disciples you want me to leave I know I'm walking with you now but you want me to go because you know what the Father's gonna send the power of the Holy Spirit that'll be with you always and not just be with you but be in you, in you. come on somebody he, he is the why of the resurrection stand to your feet everybody stand to your feet ah oh, glory be to God glory be to God when Adam disobeyed God he essentially committed treason Jesus came to redeem and to restore and release the Holy Spirit to all men in the earth in Decatur Georgia in Kenya Africa in Nassau, the Bahamas, in Beijing, China, in Toronto, Canada, in New Mexico City, Mexico, all over the world. Uh, <laughs> listen, when Jesus was led into the willing to be tempted by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says when he passed the test in 40 days, the Holy Spirit filled him beyond measure. He was filled beyond measure. You can't even measure the Holy Spirit of God. But he had to release him. When he released the Holy Spirit, when he died, the dead in Christ got up. Power, 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 power. And when he, when he was resurrected, the Holy, he passed the Holy Spirit to the disciples. Power. That's what we're missing in, in the kingdom. That's what was missing in religion. Religion is a dead end promise. You're worried, you're, you're, you're frustrated about life, nothing's going on. Power is in the kingdom. Power is in the Holy Spirit of God. That's where the power is. Hallelujah, glory be to God. Woo, glory be to God. This is not a religious message. The Bible is not a religious book. In case you didn't know, it's about a king. And the king of kings. And all your royal children who's supposed to be back in the kingdom. All right. Religion is man's attempt to reach God. He wanted to reach back up to God. But God's attempt to reach man was in relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Ooh. He is risen. He's the risen king in the kingdom. And he's calling you back. His royal children. His ambassadors to take your place again. He crushed the serpent's head. Took back authority and gave it to us. Sickness in my body, you have no authority to be here, leave. Relationship issues are going on, it's not right, you have no dominion, leave. Go and speak to your house and let them know you have dominion over your house. When you do your taxes, they ask you, are you head of household? You put, you check the box, yes. Well, tell Satan, I'm the head of household. I am the head of household in this house today. Check the box and let him know he got to go. I don't know where you're going, but you can't stay here. Amen, amen. Prayer warriors, come now, please. Your prayer warriors. Y'all don't miss this opportunity to just meet God and pray. Amen. 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 If you don't know him as a king today, here's the opportunity. If you ever felt you knew you were royalty, no matter what the other races and other people call you, you are a son and daughter of the living God. You were born into royalty. Come back home. Come back to the king. Come back where you belong. Come back to your royal family. Amen. Amen. If you want to join Connect Church, we're open. Our doors are always open. But find yourself a place to be with, commune with other church members.
It ain't the building. It's the family. It's the connection. He said, my church is my ecclesia. That's the senate of the body that carries out the work in the earth. That's what we are. So come on home. Amen. Amen.